Full disclosure, I used to love this movie as a kid. Like, a lot. And there's definitely a lot to like about this film. As an adult, though, there's a lot to not like about this film, let's say. Quest for Camelot isn't the worst thing that I've ever covered. Not by a long shot. But it's an awkward mess of very creative and not-so-creative missteps. And you don't have to be the worst thing ever made to make some serious waves. And to even damage the animation industry itself. Some backstory to this film is in order. It was made by Warner Brothers Animation and they were expecting something really big with this film. Warner Bros. basically staked their entire faith in theatrical animated films on this one movie. And what they got from it was only getting back about half of their budget domestically, and not even breaking even in the worldwide market. The failure of this movie was so spectacular that Warner Brothers not only canceled any plans for future animation projects, they stopped advertising the three films that were already in production. You can blame this film for why Iron Giant went under the radar for like a decade. Quest for Camelot came out in 1998, and besides the movies that were already in production, Warner Brothers wouldn't make another animated theatrical film until the Lego Movie in 2014, more than 15 years later. Other films that I've covered are worse, but some good things have come out of them. Chicken Little, for instance, is one of the worst animated films to ever come out of a major studio, but its critical failure must have had something to do with getting Disney back on track. Their next film was much better, much more inspired, and they started climbing out of that hole that they had built themselves in. Mars Needs Moms was also a failure, but it did finally manage to convince the animation industry that motion capture was a stupid idea. Win-wins all around, I say. No one who worked on this film had anything good to say about it. Quite honestly, I could just reiterate what some of the animators have said, and that might even take up a lengthy portion of this review. I'd say let's start with the most glaring problem on this one, but this movie has many glaring problems, to the point where I don't even know where to start. Let's see. There's there's the story, there's the characters, there's the character designs, there's the writing, there's the editing. There is so much wrong with this film. There's the structure. Like, nothing major, but every single aspect of this movie misses the mark. Almost every single aspect. I guess the best way to do this is just start with the most obvious problem. The one thing that everyone tackles this movie for. Warner Bros. desperately wanted to kick Disney's ass. Now, Warner Brothers has their strength in animation. They're responsible for the Looney Tunes and they're really good at fast-paced slapstick. Their film before this one, Space Jam, was even a fairly good hit for them. So what Warner Brothers did was completely abandon their strength to try and beat Disney at their own game. And this is the source for a great deal of problems within the movie. I don't know any other way to put this, but the animation in this film is very bad. Like, I was not prepared for how bad it actually was. I certainly don't remember it looking this stiff and awkward when I watched it as a kid. Characters do not move like they should. Through every single action, it seems like not enough of their body actually moves, which makes everyone look like a statue that's just come to life. On top of that, there's a major uncanny valley feeling in this movie. And yeah, that's because the animators were trying to copy Disney. Disney's work looks great, but if you even get to like, even 95% of what Disney should look like, it looks awful. So now we've got these overly detailed faces with bodies that don't give them any kind of life. And luckily this movie takes mostly place in the forest because God help you during the crowd shots. I mean, this dancing scene looks perfect. As in, it's the perfect degree of wrong. Some of the characters move too wild and bouncy. Some of them barely move at all. There's no sense of weight to any of it. And that's even ignoring some of the, uh, let's call them errors. You know, this circle dancing thing here might have been a pretty good effect if it didn't have people literally phasing through each other. For people trying to copy Disney, it seems like they didn't follow through a lot of Disney's actual lessons, like what they actually teach people. In scenes like this, there isn't a whole lot of arcing or secondary movement. When a character, for instance, throws a ball, it's not just their hand moving. Their whole body moves and adjusts to account for the throw. And as they go into the action, they start slow and get faster towards the middle. Without any of that, it looks like just a stilted middling mess. I mean, for everything that's not a person, the animation does its job fairly well. Except these seagulls at the end of On My Father's Wings. I have... No idea what the hell went wrong there. Whenever there's a person on screen, especially more than one, it's a constant awkward problem. I don't know if this effect comes across in truncated clips like I'm showing in this review, but once you start noticing the problems, you never really stop noticing them. Like the CGI blending. I don't know what to say about this. There is no excuse for this. I mean, Don Bluth films have a lot of CGI and y you know that it's CGI when you're watching them, but they still actually seem to fit within the universe of each of their respective films that he makes. This? Not only does it look like it doesn't belong in this movie, 
It doesn't look like it belongs in a movie. This belongs in Reboot, or some fucking PlayStation 1 game. The fact that he's covered in 3D moss, and there's also 2D moss in the same area, makes this effect even worse. Why is this creature CGI? Why couldn't this have been traditionally animated? I mean, he's not too different from the other fantastical creatures in the movie. Being CGI doesn't aid his weight or size or scale, it just makes his movements even more awkward because they're worse at computer generation than traditional animation. Not helping is the CGI from this era aged pretty poorly. You know, like many things from this movie. You know there's nothing more pathetic than a flame-retarded dragon. Devin, we, we don't use that word no more. I I'll get to the dragons later. But of course, when it comes to the animation, or rather the style of the animation, the most things people point to is the stolen character designs. Kaylee looks a bit like Belle. A lot like Belle. I mean, I wanted to be a little bit generous. After all, brown-haired girls with ponytails in animation are a dime a dozen, right? <laughs> and it might be excusable here if the overall style wasn't trying to be Disney. So not only do they have similar attributes, but just the overall design looks too close for legal comfort. Many of the characters from this movie look like they've taken too much influence from other places. Apparently Garrett was copied from the human form of the Beast from Beauty and the Beast. Zack and Wheezy here are drawn in a similar style to how Don Bluth does his dragons. And putting eyes on everything to make them look more alien, like the Enchanted Forest here, is definitely a Don Blue thing. Honestly, this might be worth complaining about more if both of those studios didn't beat Quest for Camelot's ass in theaters. I mean, two-thirds of the movie takes place in the Forbidden Forest. I wouldn't be surprised if they stole that, too. Honestly, the only thing this movie doesn't take influence from is the book that it's based on. Well, no, saying that this movie is based on a book is a lie. Even though they actually say that in the movie, it is a lie. The book that Quest for Camelot is quote-unquote based on is called The King's Damsel by Vera Chapman. It's about a girl named Lynette, because there is no Kaylee in Arthurian legend. This girl, Lynette, had been raped by a man as a teenager, and later meets him and beheads him. I've heard of worse books to adapt into children's films. Actually, no, that's another lie. You have been lied to. This is the worst book in history to try to adapt into a children's film. Yes, more so than Hunchback of Notre Dame and Pinocchio because those actually worked. And that's because this movie wasn't originally meant to be a kid's film. It was originally meant to be rated PG-13. It was meant to actually be faithful towards the book that it was based on. While some of the characters' names were already changed to that of staff members' children, which is where the Kaylee name came from, and strikes me as a very confusing move considering I know what the book is actually about. This movie had a troubled production as producers constantly changed what the thing was meant to be. Starting from a very dark and edgier film, all the way into a musical Disney clone. I mean, it worked for Black Cauldron, it should work here, right? Just once, I'd like to see one of these dark and edgier animated productions, like, actually go down the dark and edgier route, just to see if it's as horrible as producers think it's going to be. I mean, could you imagine Watership Down as a happy Easter film? Probably be better than Hop, at any rate. I mean, this movie wasn't even supposed to be a musical when it was first in production. And, you know what, I'm gonna defend that change. The soundtrack in this movie kicks ass. I think that is something that we can all accept. With two exceptions, every vocal song in this movie is fantastic. And personally, it is one of my favorite animated movie soundtracks. Now, it's not Hunchback good, but in how it sounds, it is definitely one of the times that this movie actually does stack up to 90s Disney. I can imagine the soundtrack coming out of the Renaissance era. The Prayer was the big hit from the movie, and it won all of the awards for all of the right reasons. But nowadays, I think that I Stand Alone is the one that had the most longevity. I mean, it might just be loner old me listening to this song on loop for 20 fucking years, but it's another song that holds up really good, and people still love this one to this day. The lyrics are not the best. Like every tree stands on its own. And then there's this line. Says the blind man. But out of context, this song is just fantastic. I can't get enough of this, and covers upon covers are pretty welcome. Once again, out of context. That's actually kind of a problem with the entire movie soundtrack. When you put them in context, they make the movie worse. Not one of them really moves the story along. The prayer is placed over a harsh action scene with Kaylee running for her life. The closest comparison I can think of of how this should be done is the Prince of Egypt song's Deliver Us. 
It's simply a loud song full of bombast, until the mother is speaking to her child. Then it's close and intimate and quiet. Only when the moment passes by does the bombast pick up again. There's a reason that Hunchback of Notre Dame didn't play Heaven's Light over Paris burning. I knew I'd never know that warm and loving glow, though I might wish with all my might. I Stand Alone is a song about Garrett telling Kaylee that she can't come along, and as soon as it ends, he's totally okay with her coming along. On My Father's Wings is another very good song, but all it does is reiterate what we already know at that part of the story. This world I'll never see My dreams that just won't be This horse is right With one day's ride will have covered more distance than me it doesn't even have any interesting visuals. Kaylee is just doing farm work. You can at least excuse this problem with United We Stand, as it does set up the tone, and the Celtic instrumentation of it does really set the mood of the entire film. The roll call towards the end is a bit awkward. Liberty! Justice! Trust! but otherwise, it is another classic from this movie. However, once again, the context does hurt it just a little. It's a movie that has two songs, I Stand Alone and United We Stand. With a bit more competence, this movie could really tap into the themes of togetherness and overcoming adversity with others. We can overcome everything together and all that jazz. These songs should be juxtaposed in some way, in a similar way that Hellfire was to Heaven's Light. Looking Through Your Eyes is at least more appropriate for the blind guy to sing. Look at the sky. Tell me, what do you see? Just close your eyes and describe it to me. Or not. The heavens are sparkling with starlight tonight. He sings that lyric on a rainy, stormy night. Like, dude, you walked through the rain. We saw you do that. You don't need eyes to know that you walked through the rain. I hear your heartbeat just go. That's what I see through your eyes. You hear his heartbeat through his eyes. I'm sorry, but the lyrics to this song are very bad. Once again, in context. On its own, it's a nice little duet piece that is honestly better than a lot of slow love ballads. Like, Can You Feel the Love Tonight? The ones that you'd find in other animated movies. But in context, Kaylee and Garrett don't really have much chemistry. They did like a combat thing together. But you don't see Braun falling in love with Aragon, if you know what I mean. Oh god, there's, there's probably way too much fanfiction of that very thing happening. The other two songs from the movie are balls. I don't have much to say about If I Didn't Have You. I'd be rocking with the dinos. Swinging with the rhinos. I'd be dragging Isis K in a minute. It's online with the Gargoyles song from Hunchback and a bunch of other songs in a similar vein. I will say though, it's a bad idea to reference people you're actively stealing from. It's okay when Disney references Lion King in future films because they actually made the Lion King. They made it twice to prove how much they make the Lion King. The references to things that didn't exist in the Dark Ages are very distracting during this song. It worked with Aladdin and the genie because that was a constant thing throughout the entire film and it'd be reasonable to assume that the genie would have knowledge of a future events. These two dragons can barely blow smoke, and I cannot buy that they know who Jason Voorhees is. And we get to Ruber's song. Let me tell you about Ruber's song here. I'm gonna be honest with you, like upfront honest. Ruber's song is one of the worst songs in any animated feature in history. Arthur and his kingdom will be mine. Years from now, no one will bother. To recall your good King Arthur! Like, I cannot even describe how bad this song is. What the hell even happened here? Ruber even looks like he's making up words and the melody as he goes along. Considering the trouble of production, I wouldn't be surprised if one of the producers thought that this movie needed exactly that. Either that or Ruber's massaging a headache right here. You know what, I actually like that interpretation. This song is so bad that the singer needed to massage his own headache while singing it. 
He goes back and forth between singing and talking and shouting with no transition. Say what you want about this song, I guess, but it's hard to argue that it wasn't influential. Strange for a movie to rip off Disney so hard, influenced Disney so much that they completely changed one of their best songs, Be Prepared, to be more like it in the 2019 remake. Yes, from now, no one will bother to recall your good King Arthur. Bother and Arthur don't rhyme. It's not even a slant rhyme. Where the hell did Todd put that not a rhyme button? We need a not a rhyme button right here. Now watch me create my mechanical army with pride. What does that even mean? Make a mechanical army with pride. Right, you needed a rhyme for wide. Oh wait, no, you already rhymed wide with hide. This song is so fucking bad, you think that I wrote it. Oh, and nice dancing, by the way. What do you call this thing, the malfunctioning robot? And what kind of stupid name is Ruber anyway? Sounds like Rubber, and I keep mistaking him for Rupert. To tell you the truth, Ruber is the most disappointing part of this movie for me. You'd expect him to be constantly over the top, at least so bad it's good. You know, in lines with villains like Miss Macbeth or any of the other silly villains, you'd expect him to be as mimetic as Robbie Rotten. But when you get back down to it, while he has moments like this, he's actually not over the top at all. He just shouts and cackles randomly. That is it. He's not even awkward funny, usually. Beyond his random song and dance number, he doesn't even do much that's memorable. That's not caused by this film's terrible editing, at least. I mean, we all remember this one. The ogre's butt. Like, I thought that the Nostalgia Critic truncated that clip or edited it out, and he actually said something like, move the ogre's butt. And I mean, the voice actor probably did say that, but the line that appeared in the film, after hearing it a dozen times, is indeed the ogre's butt. And then we got this moment in the movie. We cut out of nowhere to Ruber picking up some cinders from a campfire. He thinks about Kaylee and, and basically has an orgasm. That is the scene. That is the entire scene. Then they just cut away completely like it never happened. Like, the first time that I watched this, I was completely baffled. I needed to rewind to make sure I wasn't missing anything or the CD wasn't fucked up. But no, that is that is the scene. And after that, I was like, y you know what? Fuck it, Quest for Camelot. I'm, I'm gonna play the video game instead. Yeah, Quest for Camelot had a video game on the Game Boy Color. And guess what? It's a ripoff too. Now, if you don't mind, I'm gonna play this one for a while. I like Zelda. Oh, God! What the hell? Okay, maybe not. Maybe, maybe I should just do my job instead. To tell you the truth, though, all of the characters in this film are not. Kaylee is a self-centered asshole who wants to be a knight, but has no understanding of the real world and comes across as obnoxious because of it. Holy shit. I was kidding when I made that Black Cauldron comparison earlier, but no, she is literally a gender-flipped Terran from that movie. She may have stolen her looks from Belle, but everything else about her is exactly Terran, right up to the British accent that she keeps slipping out of. I mean, can that really be a coincidence? I mean, it must have been, because if they knew that Black Cauldron existed, they wouldn't have tried to repeat the exact same mistakes that killed the Black Cauldron. As you might have guessed at this point, her character is so bad because of executive meddling. After so many executives get involved in one film, there should just be like a panic button that just says cancel the whole fucking thing. The executives and the people behind this film didn't know whether they wanted to make her a tomboy or more girlish, and so they ended up giving Kaylee the worst of both worlds. A stuck up asshole thing that she can do all the dirty work, but without anything to back it up. Oh, and she falls in love with like the first boys that she's ever met. It's all the more painful that this movie went up against Mulan, the best movie ever to do this kind of character. Garrett is on the other end of the spectrum because he is a Mary Sue, or Gary Sue. Garrett has no flaws, no personal flaws at any rate. Everything he does is absolutely perfect. He can hold his own in combat despite being blind, and being blind with a tragic backstory aids the Gary Stu-ness. You would be shocked at how many Mary Stews are blind or have some other impediment. Garrett's blindness doesn't hinder him at any point in the entire story. There's the explanation that his Falcon Aiden helps him out, but if you actually pay attention, there's plenty that he does in even unfamiliar areas without that signal. And when Kaylee is training, she gets punted at the exact time as Aiden's signal. The main issue with Mary Stews is that they steal the plot. Honestly, the saddest thing that I can say about the character Kaylee is that the movie would be entirely the same without her. Like, I'm not even joking. Aiden the Falcon gets the sword lost in the Forbidden Forest, to which he could have easily led Garrett to. And with that, Garrett could have gone to Camelot himself. 
why he doesn't leave the forest at the end comes out of nowhere, and it's only there to give the other characters any purpose whatsoever. If Garrett left the forest immediately, then the dragons would have no purpose in the story either. It's a sad state of affairs when a chicken does more for the plot than three quarters of the actual main characters. No, seriously, Blade Beak is the best character in the movie. And honestly, I like it a lot because the jokes around him are very subtle. You see him early in the movie when he's still a chicken, getting bossed around by his wife. Get it? He's a henpecked husband. I like jokes that don't really spell themselves out or draw attention to them. A lot of people ask why he suddenly turns into a good guy at the end. Honestly, it's more confusing that he was helping Ruber at all. He wasn't, you know, hired or anything like any of Ruber's other henchmen. He turned good when he actually got to see his wife in the carriage at the end. If they made it a bit more clear that Ruber had her to begin with, the whole chicken plot would actually be fairly consistent. And it has the benefit of being the only good joke in the entire movie. The other jokes in the movie, well, I mean, they keep referencing other Warner Brothers products. Ruber's potion comes from the Acme Corporation. Potion I bought from some witches. Oh, I'm sorry, he got it from some witches who work at the Acme Corporation for some reason. They come across as just confusing or distracting. Like when the dragons fight at the end of the film, they just literally play the Superman theme. Why? Because Warner Brothers. Actually, no, considering what else this movie stole from, I don't think it matters who actually made the film. They'd still play the Superman theme there no matter who did it. And that brings us to the dragons, Cornwall and Devon. Uh, there's no other way to say this, but they come across as gay stereotypes from the 90s. And it's really uncomfortable to watch. Considering the era, I have no idea if this was intentional or not. I mean, lines like this... If you got me a good lawyer, I would have split 400 years ago! ...don't help the movie's case very much. And, uh, considering lines like this... You know there's nothing more pathetic than a flame-retarded dragon. This movie is definitely a product of its time. The dragons do have a lot of the tropes that would be used in that era for like actually named and outed gay characters, like in sitcoms and such. Considering the movie, I don't think it understands the meaning of intentional. Either way, they aren't very good characters, and they do ape a lot of tropes and trends of the era. We already had too many wisecracking sidekicks from Disney alone. We didn't need any more from Warner Brothers. Oh, and then there's Merlin who does nothing the entire movie, because his voice actor was put on a breather after being paralyzed. I'd imagine that his character was so downplayed because they had to write around that. And even when you get past all of the production issues, all of the bad characters and stolen whatever, the movie still has plot holes. I mean, everyone brings up the fact that Garrett didn't get healed when Excalibur was put back in the stone. You know, like everyone else got healed. Before rewatching this film, I assumed that it was just because he was, you know, born blind. But no, his backstory reveals that it was an injury. He was hit in the face by a horse hoof and slowly became blind. This healing surge seems like exactly the thing that would make him not blind. I'm all for the message of accepting disabilities, but you gotta write the plot around this. I mean, I can actually accept a lot about this movie. Like, uh, gonna take another shot at the nostalgia critic here, but he went on and on about how he constantly wanted an explanation for why the forest did strange and magical things and he never got one. Yes, because it is absolutely imperative that we get an explanation for a magical forest being magical in a children's fantasy film. But my suspension of disbelief in that excuse only really goes so far. There are still plot holes that need to be addressed. Why didn't Ruber get arrested for attempting? Gee, I don't know, fucking Reggie. Aside. They really let that guy run around the kingdom for 10 years without being just a teensy bit concerned. I mean, when the sword is stolen, they sound an alert across the whole kingdom. You'd think they'd have something similar for a goddamn assassination attempt. The Knights of Camelot seem to be something along the lines of dukes as King Arthur was going to give each of them a piece of countryside. You think that that would have made them important enough to have guards defending their home, so someone like Ruber couldn't have tried his shtick. Or at the very least, it would have put their families well off enough so that they didn't have to do their own farm work. Knights were a higher class than the peasantry. You wretched mythological moron! This is a nitpick, but if something is alive and right in front of you, even if it's fictional to the real world audience, it's not a mythological creature! How did Aiden know to attack the griffin? How did he know that? He just comes out of nowhere to attack the griffin. Does he just do this on a daily basis to get Garrett some dinner? Why didn't Aiden lead Garrett to the sword himself? Who in their right mind thought that that thing looked more like an ogre than a troll? And most importantly, who thought that anything about this movie was a good idea? 
Like I said, I loved this movie as a kid, and I watched it quite a lot. While I know the shtick behind Garrett today, I did like how badass he was, and it was almost kind of an inspiration. Like, calling a character a Mary Sue is definitely a criticism, but I can understand the appeal of Mary Sue characters. The same thing with some cliches. We've all got our own guilty pleasures and things that speak to us in special ways, even if they're not very good objectively. Sometimes the things that we used to enjoy don't hold up as well as we had hoped. But that's alright, it's a sign of our tastes and interests evolving, and hopefully getting better. But that doesn't remove the memories that we've made with them. I don't think that I'll ever be able to enjoy this film myself, personally anymore. If anything, because of that stilted animation that I can't make myself blind to. But like many of the things that I review, even the bad stuff, I do like a lot of what it left with me. And I am going to defend that soundtrack until the day I die. You know, with the obvious stated exceptions. Unfortunately, we can choose to learn good lessons or bad lessons from this kind of thing. And Warner Brothers learned a lot of bad lessons, like just giving up entirely. Quest for Camelot is often pointed to as one of the leading causes of the end of the Renaissance era of animation. Like I said, it was a glorious failure. It took the director of this film, Frank D. Chow, down to being a C-list animator. And like I said, it convinced Warner to stop making theatrical features in-house for at least 15 years. On top of that, it's also pointed to as the causing decline of the animated musical in and of itself. I would say that this and other copycats would have done it, but Anastasia is another thing that I will defend as good. It was at least successful at any rate. It's hard to know how much damage this film alone really did before Shrek changed everything, considering we're all feeling the shockwaves of this failure to this day. Honestly, it's quite impressive for a movie that's outdated hog shit. 